This is Math 251, Calculus 3, and we are beginning Chapter 13, where we'll begin talking about integration of multivariable functions. In our first section, 13.1, we're going to look at integration by way of the double integral over a rectangular region. And I'd like to start by just reviewing what we already know about how integrals came into being from Calculus 1. You may remember that we started by asking ourselves the question, how do we find the area underneath a curve? For example, if I have this curve here defined by y equals f of x, and my ultimate goal is to find out what is the area under that curve from some starting point, let's maybe just say here, which is a, to some ending point here, which is b, and I'd like to know what's the area between that curve or under that curve and the x-axis. The strategy that we used was to subdivide our region into little pieces that were almost rectangular. We used rectangles to approximate the areas. And this little yellow rectangle is an example. We went between two successive x values, forming a base for our rectangle, whose size we usually call delta x. And then the height of our rectangle, we can pick some random point here, call it c sub i, within the interval, and then the y value on the curve at c sub i, f of x sub i, or excuse me, f of c sub i, is actually the height of our rectangle. So, the area of our single rectangle, base times height, was our base delta x times our height f of c sub i, the y value on the curve. We then said we can approximate the complete area under the curve from a to b. by adding up a whole bunch of little rectangles to go all the way from one side to the other. So we might say, let's suppose that we subdivided into n rectangles. So we'll let our i values go from 1 to n. And then the area of each rectangle is this f of c sub i times delta x. Just rearrange the order of the factors. All right. The other thing that we saw, again, back in Calc 1, was the more rectangles you use, the better the approximation gets. When I just use a few rectangles, it's pretty clear that there's a lot of error in my approximation. But when I use a lot of rectangles, the amount of error becomes very, very small. The best thing we could do was actually use infinitely many rectangles. And so our next step was to actually take the limit as n went to infinity for the number of these rectangles. So we went from saying we have an approximation to the area under the curve to saying that we have an exact value for the area under the curve equals now the limit as n goes to infinity of that sum. You probably fondly remember that as the Riemann sum from Calculus 1. We probably made you do that a little while. And then we said, well, there's actually an easier way. And that easier way turns out to be the integral. So we eventually learned that the limit of the sum is the same as the integral from a to b of f of x dx. And notice that we can still see the original base and height of the rectangles within our final form here. This height of the rectangle, f of c sub i, is still here at the height of the rectangle in the integral. And this base is still here as the base dx, when we've shrunk our delta x infinitesimally small. That now actually gives me the true area under the curve, and I guess this goes from 0 to 5, but in general we could just say from A to B, 
and it's now the exact value of that area. All right, this has been our just little five minute reminder of what you did in Calc 1. And the reason for that is we're going to do something very, very similar to figure out what we're going to do with integrals for multiple, multivariable functions. So the first thing I need to ask you to remember is that when I graph a multivariable function, instead of it being a curve like y equals f of x, the graph of a multivariable function is a surface. z is equal to some function of x and y. So here we have a little piece of a surface here. z is equal to f of x and y. And I'm asking you to imagine that this right here represents some curved surface. And right now, like our goal before was to find the area under the cur curve, our goal right now is to find the volume underneath the surface. When we did the single variable functions, we limited ourselves to a particular interval from A to B. The way we're going to limit ourselves now is to look at the volume under that surface and above a particular rectangle in the xy plane. So I'm looking for the volume of that three-dimensional solid that's formed. The base is this rectangle, and the top of the surface is that curved surface. To get my volume, I'm going to start by saying, let's think about the volume of just a little column, this pinkish one you can see in here. And a column is really just a tall, skinny box, so its volume would be its length times its width times its height. Okay. When I think about the length and width of that column, the length and the width are actually just these little pieces down here in the xy plane. In fact, if I think of this piece right here as the length, Notice that's just a little piece of the x-axis. So I could call that delta x. And that's the length of my box right here. The width of my box is this little piece of the y-axis. That's actually a y-axis there. So I could call that delta y for the width of my box. So for length times width, we'll go with delta x times delta y. In order to find the height of the box, I need to think for some random point inside this little bitty square, let's go ahead and calculate the z value, the height on the surface, and that's going to be the height of our box, the height of our column. In order to do that, I have to plug the x and y values here into this function f of x and y. Now, the uh, little place I stole this from labeled this x sub k and y sub k, but I want us to think about that just a little bit. Because in fact, when you think about subdividing this box into little pieces, in fact, if I let the, the uh, subscripts here be the same, I'm not going to be able to designate all of the little rectangles here. For example, this little rectangle here might be the first one in the x direction and also the first in the y. So that might be x sub 1, 1. But if I move out to the next one, this is still in the first, well, excuse me, yeah, actually it's in the, the first column, but in the second row. So this might be x sub 1, 2. I can't necessarily assume that those subscripts are going to be the same. So I'm going to think of this instead of x sub k, y sub k. I'm going to think of it as x sub i, y sub j, to allow me to have different designations for which row and column I'm working in. So my height will be f of x sub i and y sub j. All right, that's the volume of just one column. And of course, I would have to add up the volumes of all of the columns to approximate the volume under the surface. 
So we'll go with volume under the surface is approximately equal to the sum of all of these values. f of x sub i, y sub j, times delta x, times delta y. Now here I'm going to run into a little trouble again. Because when I have my sum, I would normally write the index of that as i goes from 1 to, infinite, to n, rather. But this time, I not only let, need to let i go from 1 to n, I also need to let this j go from 1 to n. So I'm going to need a second sum. I'll let y go from 1 to n, and I'll also let j go from 1 to n. And we can mix and match. When i is 1, j can go all the way from 1 to n. And when y and I, I is 2, again, j can go all the way from 1 to n. I and J aren't always the same. All right, so there's the formula for the approximation to the volume under the surface. Just like with our rectangles, the more rectangles we use, the better the approximation to the area. Here again, the more columns we use, the better the approximation to the true volume. Notice it goes from being a very um, kind of segmented, jerky top to smoother to very smooth as I use lots and lots of columns. And in order to get the exact area, or excuse me, the exact volume under the surface, we would have to use infinitely many columns, once again letting n go to infinity. So, to get the exact volume under the surface, I would have to take the limit as n goes to infinity. of this sum of f of x sub i, y sub j, delta x, delta y. Sorry, scoot that over so you can see that a little better. There we go. And both my i goes from 1 to n, and my j also goes from 1 to n. All right. Well, our last step back in Calc 1, remember, was to say that the limit of that sum could really be calculated as an integral. And we're going to do that same idea here, but because we have the limit of two separate sums, we're actually going to need two integrals. So the volume under the surface is two integrals of this function, f of x and y. The delta x and the delta y become infinitesimally small when I use infinitely many rectangles. So they become a dx and a dy. And then I'm going to go back up to the top for just a moment to remind you. On the x-axis up here, it looks like we were going between x values of a and b. So I'm going to use those as my limits of integration, a and b. And then the y-axis looks like we started at c, and it looked now maybe I wrote over it. That was probably a d right there. So we'll go from c to d on the y-axis. And that's going to give me my exact volume. We still have to figure out exactly how to calculate that, which we'll do in a few minutes. But there's our development of our notation. One last thing before I end this piece of the video. Notice that when I wrote this integral, I kind of wrote it from the inside out. The dx, or the x limits of integration, were the a and the b. And the dy went with the y limits of integration, the c and the d. So when, in the next video, we start talking about how to evaluate these integrals. We're going to work from the inside out. The inside will be the x things and the outside will be the wise things. All right, we'll pick this up in our next video.